like a box of chocolates. Hi, I'm William B. Davis. I'm a lead actor of, from the X-Files, also Continuum and uh, Upload. I'm going to be doing a digital uh, a digital Q&A, uh, and some meet and greets and some really good stuff coming up soon. So, so here comes the information. It's not every day I get a research question on pagan idolatry. <laughs> oh, well, call it a hobby. But you said you were interested in local lore? Mm-hmm. I'm afraid Indiana isn't really known for its pagan worship. Well, what I'll be doing the Q&A at, uh, at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. It will stream live on both Facebook and YouTube. And I uh, hope you can have a look. <laughs> so you got murdered. <laughs> no, I, I was in a car accident. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, you just uh, threatened a $600 billion a year industry and no one murdered you. <laughs> uh, nobody murders anybody. <laughs> Following the Q&A, you can do a meet and greet right with me personally, and we'll have a chat, and it'd be good to see you. You've killed men. You can kill a man, but you can't kill what he stands for. Not unless you first break his spirit. It's a beautiful thing to see. Autographs and video greetings are also available. For all the information, look at fullempirepromotions.com. You know, your sweetness would be a lot more convincing if we hadn't already met your predecessor. Predecessor? Oh, bravo! A performance of the first magnitude. Perhaps you really have duped your shipmates after all. I look forward to seeing you on November 29th. Cheap, thoughtless, perfunctory gift that nobody ever asks for. Unreturnable because all you get back is another box of chocolates. So you're stuck with this undefinable whipped mint crap that you mindlessly wolf down when there's nothing else left to eat. Sure, once in a while there's a peanut butter cup or an English toffee, but they're gone too fast and taste is fleeting. They end up with nothing but broken bits filled with hardened jelly and teeth-shattering nuts. If you're desperate enough to eat those, all you've got left is, a, is an empty box filled with useless brown paper wrappers. They've reopened the X-Files.
Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Full Empire Promotions live event. I'm Dominic. I'll be your host for this special Q&A with William B. Davis. We're live on Facebook and YouTube, so thanks so much to everyone who's joining us live. If you'd like to ask William any questions or leave any comments, please feel free to do so, and we'll get to those during the broadcast. If you'd like your own private conversation with William, following this Q&A, he'll be doing one-on-one -on -one video meet and greets on Zoom. You can have five minutes to chat with William about whatever you'd like, and I will even send you a recording of your meeting. In addition, you can get personally signed photographs, as well as uh, uh, video greetings at fullempirepromotions.com. Sales for the one-on-one -on -one Zoom chats will end at about 5 p.m. Eastern. So if you're thinking about getting that, I would advise you to do that uh, within the hour. The autographs and the video greetings will remain on sale until 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern tomorrow. Uh, well, without further ado, uh, I'm honored and excited to welcome uh, one of TV's most iconic villains of all time, the star of The X-Files, Continuum, Supernatural, Smallville, Stargate SG-1, Stephen King's It, and most recently, uh, the odd sci-fi film Residue, an appearance on The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina and the, the Amazon comedy Upload. Light one up for the actor, author, director, teacher, and one heck of a nice guy, William B. Davis. William, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for the, for the intro. <laughs> nice intro, by the way. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, the, the I, I always love the way the cigarette smoking man sort of looks regal. You know, when he likes a cigarette, he sticks his nose up and... You know, I've noticed that a lot of those clips, you know, he's very regal about it. <laughs> so, you know, usually, usually you see detectives in movies have that have it hanging out of their mouth, kind of sloppy, and you know, the ashes yeah. are falling. Out. He's very regal with his. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, how have you been? Have you been uh, watching anything interesting on TV or or, or uh, film during during the pandemic, or what have you been doing oh, well, to keep busy? Yeah. yeah, lots of stuff. Lots of uh, lots of great. Uh, uh, British, uh, I suppose, cop drama shows that are really about people, but they're also about about an investigation. And some really, some really good ones from different parts of the British Isles as well. There was, uh, and I forget the names of them all, but uh, it was Unforgotten, and there was uh, uh, one way up north in the Hebrides somewhere, and um, and of course we've all been watching. The Queen's Gambit, Gambit, and uh, the Crown, and of course our old friend Gillian and the Crown as well too. So, yeah, <laughs> watching lots of stuff. Yeah, well, that's the good thing about uh, you know about this day and age. You know, you, you don't run out of material to watch. You know, there's more streaming services than channels now. Yeah, I know it's amazing. So. Um, yeah, well, I want to start off by plugging your book. You wrote a book. Uh, about yeah. eight or nine years ago called Where's Their Smoke? You, you gave me a signed copy here, which was great. Uh, what influenced you to write your memoirs and, and how long did it take for you to complete? Well, it took, it took quite a while. Um, um, hard to say what influenced me. It's been a, really an extraordinary life, frankly. I mean, I'm, I don't say that as a matter of pride so much as a matter of just uh, happenstance of the strange things happened to me. I went unusual places and unusual had uh, experience with unusual people, especially in terms of the performing arts and, and acting and and uh, and theater and film and TV and so on. So um, I wanted to kind of put that together, find some sort of me I don't know about meaning. I don't know if there's any meaning, but there's a shape to the to the journey that I took. And uh, it was a huge pleasure to kind of go back and meet people that I would never have re-looked for, you know, back in my in my background, and and, and it all kind of came together. It, in in retrospect, maybe I was too personal in this, but there it is. It's out there. Maybe I should have been a little more careful. But it makes for good reading. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it was it's been quite an adventure, and and that just took took me to, you know, twenty ten roughly speaking, I think, and and then of course quite a lot's been going on in my life since then, you know. I'm now working on a new book, 
a new book about acting in particular, a kind of memoir of acting and a handbook on acting or ideas about acting that I learned through this whole process. So it's been fun. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I actually like how, how kind of raw um, and, and uncensored you are in your book because that's the reason we read them. You know, look, if we want the, if you want the padded stuff, we can read that online somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to write an apology, you know, you yeah. know, or a defense or, or whatever. People do that, you know, say, ah, I was right, everybody else was wrong. You know, okay, 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 we know that. You don't, have to, you don't need a book for that. Yeah. Very true. And if, and if you guys watching are interested, you can get uh, signed copies of William's book on his website above us, williambdavis.com, or uh, unsigned copies uh, on Amazon. I would recommend getting the signed one, but uh, both available there. And uh, I do want to start off uh, with your roots by talking about your roots a little bit. Uh, you were born in Toronto, Ontario, correct? Correct. Did you grow up in, in Toronto? Um, until, um, uh, I, I guess one measures one's life in those days by your grade. <laughs> until grade 11, I was, I was in Toronto. And then we moved outside of Toronto into still southern Ontario, but we were in the country for my last three years of high school. And, and that's where the family lived after that. But, uh, right. Did you watch a lot of TV growing up or, or listen, listen to a lot of radio? TV? What, what first? TV? You mean <laughs> pictures in a little box? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I remember a friend had one um, and we would go Friday night to his house because they had a little 12 inch TV and we would watch wrestling and boxing. Or sometimes you could watch it in uh, store windows. Um, but no, we got a TV eventually when I was in, it was after we moved to the country, because I remember the day I arrived home from school and I heard this sound coming from inside the house and it could only be television. I was very excited. Um, and we mostly, we couldn't wait to see the Grey Cup game, which is the big national football game in Canada. Uh, on television, and the picture went to snow for the entire game. So we had these problems. But um, to answer your question more directly, I, watch, I listened to a lot of radio, a lot of radio drama. I did a lot of radio drama as an actor, as a child actor. Um, but I listened to a lot. I, I, I kept records of it. I, I graded the performers by how good I thought they were. Um, so yeah, that was a big part of my growing up. Yeah, your teaching and, and mentoring kind of set in early. You know, you're already, <laughs> yeah. you're already rating people. Oh, um, no. So, so what first attracted you to to the arts? Was it was it was there an influence uh, off screen? Something in your family that pushed you to do it, or was it just something well, in you that you had yeah, to? It, it, it was in the family, um, not my immediate family, but my cousins, or actually second cousins. They're a, a generation older than I. Um, but they were they were very much into acting and film production, and they ran a summer theater company in uh, in Ontario tourist country in Muskoka. And uh, what kind of happened basically was uh, uh, they were doing a play where they needed a boy uh, about eleven, and they as it happens they rehearsed their plays in our basement before they went north for the summer. So they need an 11 year old boy. Who can we find? Oh, oh, there's one. <laughs> Here, you do it. <laughs> and that was the beginning of my acting career. Um, and it's funny, Americans still kind of do that to Canadian actors, I feel like, American productions. Who can we get that lives over here that's, you know, known? You know, so we don't have to fly somebody over. You know, I feel like that still kind of happens. Yeah. Well, you worked in the theater, as you mentioned, for many years before making the transition to TV and film. Uh, you worked with many uh, great actors who would go on to have big careers like James Woods and Donald Sutherland. Uh, can you share one or two plays that you that you had that were, were fun to work on that stick out in your mind? Um, sure. Um, Sutherland was, was a really interesting story because, because we were uh, undergraduates together at the University of Toronto. There was no theater program as such. It was all extracurricular, but we did a, an extensive extracurricular program. And uh, Sutherland was, well, I hate to say it, but he was not very good. 
It was very raw. Um, but we did a production of The Tempest in which he played Stefano, and he was actually pretty good in that. Um, but I remember sitting in the in the auditorium with him uh, during a rehearsal or whatever, and him saying to me, you know, I know I can act. And I kind of looked at him and thought, okay, well, you know something the rest of us don't know. <laughs> but that's interesting that you know that. Um, so we never thought he'd go very far. But anyway, he went off to England. He went to Lambda, same theater school that I went to. He hated it. I loved it. But that's another story. Um, but then uh, subsequently, I was directing in England and doing a play called Two for the Seesaw. And we cast that in England, in doing this in, in provincial theater in, in England. And so we cast Donald in Two for the Seesaw. And he was marvelous. He had so, he had so grown as an actor. He was so... Um, connected, so real, and so organized. It was lovely to work with. He had found his stride. Yeah. Uh, if, no, sorry, continue. You know, then then later I worked with, uh, uh, not that I did a lot of direct work with him, but I was an assistant director at the National Theatre uh, with Finney and, and Maggie Smith. And that was fascinating to watch. And I remember Finney, in one one rehearsal, he he seemed so spontaneous, so like it's all just happening right now. It's, and I thought, ah, he's doing a kind of improv, I thought. And then I looked at the script and I realized he was word perfect. And it's but it sounded like he was making it up as he went along. It's great. Wow. Well, do you remember uh, your first audition when you when you try to kind of transition to TV and film? Uh, interesting. I remember my first one when I went to radio when I was only 11, um, or maybe 12, but yeah, I was probably 11 and, uh, really didn't know what an audition was. He had me read the part and, uh, then the director, he said, well, just now do it without the script, do it not looking at the script. So I did. And then I got the part. But obviously, the first time I was kind of reading it and acting it, and the second time I was <laughs> natural. Um, but then, of course, the most famous one, it wasn't one of my first, I'd done lots by then, was, was for uh, X-Files, you know, where I auditioned for the senior FBI agent. Character had three lines. And uh, I even had, I think, two auditions for it. And uh, yeah, I didn't get it. Didn't get that part. They gave me this other part that had no lines called the cigarette smoking man. Well, thank God for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Chris Carter must have been uh must have been a tough caster because everybody that I talked to from the X Files, they, I think Mitch had to audition for like for five different roles before he got Skinner. Yeah. You know, so they must it, be it actually happens in our business, you know. And you know, even now you think I have a reputation. Sometimes I, sometimes people offer me a part, but sometimes I'm just auditioning with everybody else you know? yeah i never i never quite understand that i mean i'm not in that side of the business but i never quite understood when you know i mean like asking clint eastwood to audition it's like come on you know asking <laughs> any veteran actor it's like you know their work yeah yeah exactly you know? i know i know but uh I, one of your early credits include a small part in david cronenberg's the dead zone uh you know one of my favorite films did you get to spend much time with uh mr cronenberg on that film I did not spend much time with him. I remember from the audition, actually, now that you mention it. And, uh, you know, I did, uh, we did have some exchange on set, but um, this was actually my first speaking role, I guess, on film. After I'd, I'd for many years, I'd been a director and a teacher and had not been acting for a long time. And then I went back to it when I was older. Uh, so this was kind of one of my first kind of ways in. Um, playing the ambulance driver. And uh, we were at Niagara-on-the-Lake, if anyone knows that, it's right on the, on the north coast of Lake Ontario in the middle of winter. It was 30 below zero, I believe. Um, uh, I don't know how the background people had managed. Uh, fortunately, because I was the ambulance driver, I could mostly be in 
my heated ambulance. Uh, I would get out to do a scene and then I'd rush back to my ambulance. Uh, but as is often the way, I know it's your favorite film, but you didn't see me in it. Yeah, yeah. I think, people people might... I think I have a credit. I think I'm in the credits, but I'm not in the film. <laughs> um, so my, my four lines <laughs> ended on the cutting room floor. But... People might be able to go back and watch now and try to find you. <laughs> yeah. So, if they do, let me know because I I looked quite quite hard. Today. Yeah, I, I've seen that movie more times than I can count. I don't remember seeing you in it. So yeah, that's right. You won't have. You won't. Yeah. Well, oddly enough, uh, uh, the Dead Zone was written by Stephen King, and uh, then you did another Stephen King film, uh, his miniseries It, uh, about nine, eight or nine years after that, playing uh, Mr. Gaudreau. Uh, can and you I talk a little? Have a lot more luck with that one either. Uh, I had a little bit of luck because there is at least one scene left, but there was quite a lovely scene that we auditioned. Actually, we shot it, but it didn't make it either. I think we shot it. Now, I'm, actually, now I'm not sure whether we eventually shot it or not. But, but uh, the attraction to doing the role was this other scene that never appears in the movie. Man, you just don't have any luck with Stephen King. <laughs> did did you did you notice him on set at all when you were filming? Did you get to meet him at all? No, not at all. No, no. Well, uh, you know, an actor tends to uh, only be on set when they're filming their scenes. Uh, right. Are you that way, or do you do you hang out on set and kind of observe other actors? Well, you're actually not even there a lot of the time. I mean, you're only there um, the days that you actually shoot. Otherwise, they don't call you on set. Um, so you're only there a limited number of days, and yeah, and then it's a then it's a choice whether you can get a look. It depends on the feel of the set and what's going on. Uh, whether you just hang out in your trailer, or whether you actually can get a nice view around the uh, around the monitors and actually watch what other people are doing. But yeah, I'm always pretty attentive to what other actors do. Yeah, I would think being you know with the, with the teacher and teaching in you and mentoring you. You know, you, I know you're, you love acting, so. Uh, well, you made memorable appearances on popular TV shows such as 21 Jump Street, The Commish, and Sliders. But you landed the role, which would make 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 you a household name with The X-Files. Uh, we, we did talk a little bit about uh, the audition for that, but uh, how was the character described to you? Was, was it what drew you to want to audition for the role? Well, as I say, I did not audition for the role. <laughs> I auditioned for the senior FBI agent, right. and they gave me this other role. And, uh, you know, I was a working actor in the trenches. This is It's a gig. Uh, they paid me scale um, to do this, uh, this role in the, uh, in the pilot, in which I stand around and I watch things, and I, I have serious thoughts, but no one knows what they are. Um, so no one told me anything about the character. Uh, I think they just wanted somebody who could look mysterious. So I, I, th I guess I did look mysterious. Um, and and so it's only gradually that it developed after that that uh, they got interested and gave the character a little bit more. Uh, some of the support that I got really came from the Internet. It was very early days of the Internet, and they got quite a... Um, quite a, a, a keen, I don't know if it's a very large, but a very keen following, and they got interested in the character. And uh, their interest uh, provoked the producer's interest, and, and uh, gradually, it, uh, gradually it developed. And the story that Bob Goodwin tells, who was a producer on the show, is, is uh, at a certain point, uh, Glenn Morgan wrote this episode called One Breath with me having a really major scene. And uh, Bob had to direct it and he went, what? I mean, what, what, what is this? I mean, can Bill Davis act? We don't know anything about him. He just <laughs> plays his role and stands around in the background. And uh, you know, I said, it, said to him since, well, didn't you look at my resume at least? Oh no, we're too busy <laughs> to do that. So anyway, he, and he was he was thrilled as it happened. He loved 
my work. And, and from there, they just did more and more and more and more and it became more central to the, to the storyline. That's great. Uh, your character went through many name changes, the smoking man, the cigarette <laughs> smoking man, the cancer man. Uh, what, did they ever mention why they kept changing his name? And, and which, one did you pre which one do you prefer for the character? Well, I think the real name, and I'm trying to think what it is, uh, Gerhard something, uh, the German name. It's in, Yeah, they very rarely the, use it. Well, it came at the very end, the very end, of the very last um, reboot of the show. Mm -hmm. um, when I have this long opening speech about who I really am and what I've gone through. And, um, but yes, before that, I was mostly CGB Spender, once they gave me a name. But that was pretty fake, you know, and um, there was never a Bible for the story, so things kept changing, you know. And even when I wrote this own episode of On a Me, I mean, I gave myself an office for CGB Spender, but then I had the office disappear. Uh, so when Scully goes back to it, it's gone. Where did it go? I mean, there's no no trace of this character. Um, so it's all all mysterious. Yeah. Right. You, you'd mentioned that you didn't have much direction on the character. What were there any uh, characters or anybody that you used as kind of an influence on on his movements? Like, how did you develop you know your version of the character? Yeah. Um... I'm not good at uh, imitating a real person, so it was not uh, was not my inclination to think of somebody how they behaved and what they looked like and to try to copy that in some way. Uh, some actors can do that very well, and and some don't, and I'm one of the ones that doesn't. Um, but. I mean, what mostly motivated me was to try to find why I was right, why I'm doing what had to be done, and Mulder was doing what had to not be done. Um, so that was a good part of organizing my approach to my life in the story. Um, then the smoking was interesting for me because I had quit years and years and years ago. But I had learned to smoke when I was 12, as many people do. Right. And they do it because they feel big. They feel confident. They feel, at 12, like a hotshot. <laughs> so the smoking kind of gave me some of this arrogance, you know, this, this uh, sense of... Um, power or authority or whatever. Um, but then why am I smoking now so much at this stage in, in, in the character's life? And, and there, to me, it was very much like I had to hollow out what was inside. I had to dull it down because if I ever really faced up to, the, to what I was causing, what I was doing to people, I couldn't live with it. I had to shut it down in order to do what I had to do. Um, so those are some of the kind of key elements, I think. I can see that. Yeah, he was he was almost uh, ghostly, you know, the character. He, yeah. Very kind of transparent, kind of like smoke, I thought. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the, in the very early years, I said, uh, you know, it was the DOP who really made the character because they kept lighting me, you know, through smoke and around and they always lit me from the side, so I had every wrinkle that I had, which wasn't so many then, it is now, but it wasn't that showed up. People would see me in life and say, wow, you look a lot younger than you did on the show. Because yeah. <laughs> I was lit. Uh, so, the, you know, I had a lot of help. Yeah. He had some great dialogue, your character. Did they let you improvise much, or was it pretty much, uh, you know, stick to the script? Um, they're never really, um, I mean, some, some sets are just rigid kind of word for word. They were not on the whole. Um, every once in a while you get a different director or a different script supervisor who would get more particular. But 
No, there was there wasn't any kind of free improv in terms of creating the scene, but there was a sense in which I could um, adjust a little bit according to what came out more naturally from me. And then for me in particular, um, where I changed the script consciously was to was to hide my Canadian accent. So I tried never to say out, about, or host. <laughs> right. you say out, about, house, <laughs> which I find very hard to do. Yeah. So I'm trying not to say them at all <laughs> if I could help it. Yeah, so there was sure. one episode we did, and and uh, um, who who was in? Oh, the fat man. Uh, uh, forget his name. Anyway, very Canadian actor, and we were at the racetrack, and we just sounded Canadian, but nobody seemed to care. <laughs> but great. Well, were there um, ever any episodes that you got when you saw the script? And you, when you, once you read the script and you said, God, this is terrible. My character wouldn't do this. Do you, do you recall uh, any, any of those? Yep, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And probably the most popular episode we ever did. Musings of a cigarette smoking man. <laughs> so <laughs> when you read that script, you said, no, this is, you wouldn't do this. No, this is bizarre. This is really bizarre. Um, and we, I did, it's one of the few times we really did have conversations with Chris. Um, and there were things that, he hated about the script when he first got it because when he first got the script i successfully murdered froicky in that script it would have been the end of the lone gunman and uh, chris was not having that he wanted those characters to stay in the show so he made them change that um but yeah there were a lot of things that i, I mean aside from the by the way, I, the box of chocolate scene is so curious. I mean, it's so interesting. It was interesting to see it on the promo because it's talking about chocolates, but you're thinking about something else altogether. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, you know, a lot of that, uh, that I'm writing a bad novel seemed unlikely. But there were actually some literal things about whether I'd killed anybody or not killed anybody. I've forgotten what they were. Because um, it seemed as if uh, Glenn Morgan just hadn't, watched the previous season so there was information that just conflicted um, but in the end in the end it was a very successful episode and it was uh, we we kind of took it as we did it and kind of so this is what froicky thinks this character is it didn't necessarily have to be what i would be all the time but froicky has this picture of the character and then and looking at it many years later when i came to write the book actually I kind of you see it sort of as a postmodern fantasy, and it's fabulous in, in those terms. So, uh, but yeah, I was very skeptical <laughs> at first, but I'm won over by now. I think. <laughs> yeah, I would say. I would say. <laughs> well, you had a great uh, cast to work with, with uh, David Duchovny and, and Mitch Pileggi and Gillian Anderson and Nicholas Lee and, and many many others. Did you connect with any of the main cast off screen? Um. The ones I would connect with the most, I suppose, would be the the Canadians uh, or the ones based in Canada, like like Chris Owens and uh, John um, Neville, uh, um, and that was in a way mostly. Uh, well, maybe two things. I mean, but happenstance. I'm just more inclined to see them because we're in moving in the same circle, whereas the Americans were off in America. And we were off in Canada when we're not doing the, the show. Um, but, you know, I've, I'm very fond of Mitch, and we've seen each other a lot at your conventions, as you know, and uh, and David and Jillian as well. You know, so. Yeah, great. Well, you guys have great chemistry, you know, all four of you. Just the show doesn't, the show doesn't work without you. So um, I do have to talk about some of the guest stars. The show had some really good uh, guest stars that would come in and out of the show, like... Uh, Stephen McCaddy and Steve Rails back and, and uh, many, many others, Brian Thompson. <clears throat> Did you, were there any guest stars that were, were not in your episodes that you'd wish you worked with? Any actors you remember seeing connected to the show? They were not, they were not in my episode? Yeah. Oh my gosh, yes, certainly. Um, but if you ask me to remember who, I'll have to talk <laughs> I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure I can answer for you. Uh, well, in that same vein, who are some of your favorites to work with? Um, what's the name? Uh, I know you did you did a couple things with Stephen McCaddy, you know, after the X Files. Yeah, I did the Tall Man, <laughs> yeah, which I remember much more than X Files. Um, and um, trying to remember the name of the actor who was in Talitha Kumi with me. There was the one that was locked up and had this big scene about. Um, uh, Anybody watching knows it. <laughs> Drop a comment. It'll, it'll come to me. Because, yeah. <laughs> because what was so much fun about that scene and that actor was, uh, you know, the scene was great. Love was one of my favorite episodes to do. But years later, um, this man in New York who had more money than he knows what to do with, I guess, um, he was, they were doing a reenactment or a re um, visiting of their engagement with he and his wife with his, to, 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 to celebrate their anniversary, basically. And they had fallen in love watching X-Files and in particular, watching this episode, Talitha Kumi. So his idea of a lovely surprise for his wife now was to bring me from Vancouver to New York to do this scene live uh, by surprise in front of his wife. Wow. And, and he paid first class travel and brought us opera tickets and all sorts of things. But better than that, was it so happened that the actor, whose name is temporarily escaping me, lived in New York. So once we got onto that, we found him and got him on board. So we actually rehearsed the scene like it was a theater scene in secret and then presented it as a surprise to the assembled multitudes. Wow, that's, that's awesome. I wish somebody had that recorded on YouTube somewhere. Yeah. Uh, Wow. Uh, we've got a couple people, I believe, Need, Nied, somebody that looks like French name. Uh, is the smoker an alien? Is the smoker an alien? Is that the question? That's what it looks like, yeah. I don't believe he is, but I believe he's part alien now. <laughs> uh, no, the smoker is not an alien, but he had a deal with the aliens, I think, um, so that he worked with them to try to ensure that some remnant of human civilization would survive, survive their colonization of the planet. Yeah, makes sense. He was always kind of a uh, thinker, that character. Yeah. For sure. Do you think he could ever give up smoking, your character? That's a good question. Maybe. Maybe. It, would make, it would make him interesting, you know, because he'd have to find different vices. Some, so, yeah. well, or just some total change, just some miraculous change. Yeah, I mean, if, he was close to falling in love with Scully. If she'd fallen in love with him back, maybe, <laughs> maybe that would have done it. Did they ever give you any uh, any opportunities to write or direct an episode? Well, yeah, I mean, not to direct. I wish I had. I wish I'd pushed that earlier, but. Um, I did write one episode on ME in season seven. Um, it was greatly um, altered and developed through the process and finally overwritten by Chris. But the substance idea, substance idea uh, was, was my original thought. So, yeah, so that was fun to do. Great, great. So after all these years, what do you think, uh, in your opinion, what makes the X-Files such a hit? Is it just, you know, came at the right time? Well, I, I used to, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's obviously lots of reasons because it's, it's still people look at it and say it's their favorite show and, and whole new generations are going back looking at it and, and loving it. So and it's caused countless ripoffs as well, you know? Yes, true enough, <laughs> true enough. Um, but I think a lot of my thought at the time was, as it was in the 90s when we were just getting the internet established, we were just getting computer life established. We're just 
sort of vaguely coming online. And the sense of what's real and what's not real became more kind of amorphous, more kind of uncertain. Um, you know, whereas, you know, generations earlier, you'd say, you know, somebody would have an idea and you'd say, well, how do you know that's true? And you'd say, well, it's in the book. Um, but by the 90s, people weren't really reading books. They'd, they'd say, well, I, I saw it on the internet. And then you'd go to look for it on the internet and it would disappear in front of you. So you'd even lose that. So so everything was kind of flashing around and, and feeling indistinct. And so a, a series about, I mean, its original assumption was to take ideas that that most people don't think are real and pretend they are. I mean, let's suppose these things are real. Let's suppose aliens really are coming to the planet. Let's suppose aliens are being abducted. Let's suppose um, uh, astrology is accurate. Let's, you know, all, let's suppose hypnosis work or, you know, uh, right. and, and developed all these stories. When the, the, the challenge for the series is they, they eventually ran out of things. <laughs> they'd, they'd done everything that fit that kind of cat. So then they had to have a real story where real things happen to real people. And then it kind of grew from there. But uh. Yeah. Well, as you said, I believe, I believe the, uh, the internet was a big influence on the show as well and, and helped it, you know, help the show come along. Um, James is watching. He says, do you believe? Do I believe? Just believe. I believe some things. I believe um, <laughs> conversation now. I believe James just asked me the question. Um, but if he means, uh, do I believe that uh, there are aliens among us? No, I don't. And especially, do I believe that alien humans have been abducted by aliens? No, I don't. And I have looked into that in some some detail. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a skeptic by the kind of traditional sense of the word skeptic, and I actually belong to skeptic societies and I give them money and things, which means uh, a kind of devotion to rational thought, I suppose, and, and requiring evidence to accept things. I agree, I agree. There's there's too much te too much technology now where if they existed, we would see them. You know, I mean, everybody's a phone in their pocket, there's cameras everywhere, there's, you know, uh, there hasn't been enough evidence for me to believe. Well, the, and the, the other side of it, I used to say too, because I used when I used to go to a, uh, conventions in the '90s, and you know, I'd ask people, uh, you know, how many people believe that there are aliens among us, and maybe half of the people would put up their hands, and 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 then I'd say, how many of you believe in government conspiracies? Every hand would go up, and then and then I would say, but Clinton couldn't keep eleven meetings with an intern secret. <laughs> How on earth are they keeping this whole story of aliens secret? I mean, how many people would have to be involved in that and and would keep it keep it quiet and somehow it would never leak out and there'd be yeah. no WikiLeaks. There'd be no. Um, no it doesn't seem, yeah, it doesn't seem very um, very likely to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before and after the X Files, you worked on many TV shows, including Smallville, Supernatural. Uh, Stargate SG-1 and Continuum. Uh, was there a series at that time on TV that uh, you didn't get to work on that you were hoping for? Oh, gosh, probably lots. <laughs> um, I mean, do you remember being a fan of a show at that time and saying, God, I'd love to get on that show? Ah, uh, it's a good question. It's a good question. Because there were lots of shows I wasn't getting on. Um, it was interesting. There was a um, a series, a Canadian series that was very popular and shot here and I couldn't get so much as an audition and uh, I think that was because uh, they didn't want my the, the baggage I would bring to it as a recognized person from another story they wanted the natural realism of it um, so I okay maybe also the lead actor was very short and I was very tall so maybe that was a but still I thought Surely they could get me on that show. Um, what other shows? Wow. I always thought you would have been really good on Twin Peaks. I thought you would have fit in well with Les Lynch's universe. <laughs> you know? Probably. But yeah, probably a lot of those kind of shows. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I loved uh, a series that you did that I don't think many people saw, uh, but I enjoyed it called Fear Itself, uh, where you did an episode that was directed by John Landis called Till Death Was Part. Uh, I don't know if you recall much about that. You played a priest. Oh, is that the one with uh, Jay Brazil and I played priests? Yes. Yeah, where, where she gets a note saying she's getting married to a serial killer, and in the end, you find out that it's her. Ah. Oh, yeah. No, I don't remember very much about it. But, yeah. Yeah, it was a yeah. great, great episode, that show. It was uh, 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 ABC, I think, or CBS, one of them. But it was, you know, it was directed by the great John Landis. Uh -huh. Well, you played uh, Mr. Lamont in the oddly trippy film Residue recently as one of your recent credits. Uh, I felt like I was on drugs watching this movie, but I couldn't, I couldn't stop watching it. It's kind of like a, <laughs> kind of like a weird hybrid of uh, William Burroughs and H.P. Lovecraft. Yes. What, what attracted you to this role? Well, I mean, I don't know that I ever understood it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they were nice guys, and uh, it was a fun situation to do, and uh, um, it was fun to play. Um, they would, they actually had hoped that it was a trilogy, so we were still, you know, hoping that they would do the next, uh, next iteration of it but it has not happened well hopefully soon you know but it is on on amazon if anybody wants to check it out residue okay. pretty pretty good film because you you kind of cigarette smoking man vibe in it you know the suit yeah. and the tie and the authority figure uh we've got a question here do you believe you could have one more axe for a different ending knowing that fans did not like the ending of season 12 Huh. What does an axe mean? I guess, episode? yeah, I guess uh, uh, a different retelling of the ending. Do you think they're ever going to pick it, you know, bring it, bring it back and redo the ending, have it have a better ending? Yeah, it's yeah, it's curious. I have to say, I've never been really wedded to the whole idea of the sun. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree. Uh, I know at the time we shot that last episode, and uh, I think Chris was still hoping there would be more episodes, but he didn't necessarily think this was the end because he was careful to tell Chris or tell uh, Mitch that even though I'd run over him in a car, he didn't die. Yeah. Um, but I had to tell him that even though I'd been shot and pushed in the in the water. I had not died, but that wasn't me either. That was a hologram. Um, but he didn't know that. But he thought that was a good idea once I suggested. It's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, we'll see. Hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully they get in something going with it. I mean, I, I know Jillian said over and over she won't do it, but I, I really don't think they need her, honestly. You know, I think they can do it without her. Just my opinion. But yeah. I think there's enough, there are enough really good characters in the show where they could, they could, they could do, you know, a couple more seasons without her. They actually pitched a series. I, I don't know if this, I guess it's not confidential because it's over. They pitched a series to the network that would be um, the, the life of the smoking man. It would be centered around this, my character and it would uh, involve, I think, historical episodes. And, and uh, But the studio didn't buy it. But Fox has of course, Fox has been taken over by Disney. Yeah. And, and so I guess there's different people involved. So it might be much harder now to move an X-File idea. Um, and you can't get it out of there because Fox owns the, uh, the rights to all the characters. Right. Right. And I'm wondering if we're going to see the X-Files on Disney Plus on that network. <laughs> I, I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, currently you're playing uh, uh, David Choke on the Amazon series Upload. I watched a few episodes and, and really enjoyed them. Uh, knowing you as a person, you're actually funny. You know, you're really funny. You got a great <laughs> sense of humor, and uh, it's nice to see you doing uh, some comedy. Are you, are you enjoying being funny on screen? I I I love to do comedy, and I actually often thought, and people have often said, I have a talent for it. Yeah. But somehow my reputation and whatever went in another direction. But yeah, it's I I totally like it. Yeah, it's fun. Um, have they uh, have they talked about doing a second season of Upload? Oh yes, yes, great, yeah, great. Um, did I just admit something out of 
Oh, maybe I said something I shouldn't have said. I don't know. But yes, as far as I know, <laughs> they're going to shoot the second season. Uh, Great. Great. They, uh, well, hopefully, hopefully they, they give you some, uh, you know, some juicy stuff to do. And, you know, they need some really good scenes in the first season. So yeah, should be great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other any other projects in the works coming out that you want to mention? Um, there's, I mean, there were, there were some theater things we had going before the uh, pandemic just shut us down. I had a love as a director. I had a lovely production, stage production. I've looked back in anger with some wonderful actors. And we were just two weeks before opening, and then everything was shut down. So, how we'll get uh, regenerated that way, I don't know. But I am in the throes of writing book number two, um, which, as I say, is a book really about acting. It'll be called something like On Acting. Or um, I've actually, I act the style of the book is I kind of based it on Stephen King's book called On Writing, where he's done a, the first half is a memoir of him, his life as a writer, and the second half is kind of what he learned about writing and as a kind of a manual for writers. So I'm basically following that same pattern because my my uh, theatrical history is so unusual and so informative and and then after all these years god knows i've learned something huh yeah, i believe <laughs> so, you have <laughs> okay, yeah. let's see if we can articulate it and it's not easy to do but that's what i'm working on yeah yeah it seems like so much work writing a book you know it seems like so much work but uh, it is but i must say i like doing it so yeah yeah, well, there's there's a really good book uh, about David Cronenberg out that I have as well. That's similar. You oh. know, he talks about uh, he didn't write it, but it's it's basically like a really long interview. That somebody asking him, or the author asking him questions, and it's formatted like a you know really long interview. But he talks about writing and directing and politics in Canada and all that. You know, it's a really good book. Yeah. So, well, uh, we're running up on an hour here so we're going to wrap this soon but i do have to ask uh, my final question that i ask everybody i talk to i'm probably going to put you on the spot but uh oh, i have oh, to oh. ask uh, okay. uh, if you could pick one actor or actress to play the lead in a film with you and one director to direct the film who would you pick there's there's two caveats they have to be people you've never worked with before and they have to be people who are still alive oh dear Hmm. 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 Nobody I know is still. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, that's a, that's why it's hard. Okay. Because... Okay, I'll give you a director. Oh, I can do it all in one. I can do it all in one. Woody Allen. Oh yeah, there you go. That'd be great. Woody Allen, you work with him, and he and he directs it. Uh, yeah, very cool. Very cool. <laughs> well, uh, William, it's always great talking to you and, and getting to know a little bit more about you. Uh, I, I want to thank you for uh, sharing some of your stories, and uh, I hope we can we can hang out in person again at a convention. Let's hope soon, huh? So, Before too long. Before yeah, too long. Let's hope things are looking good. So. Um, all righty. Well, thanks so much, William, and we'll see you in the uh, Zoom session shortly. Okay. You bet. All right. See you there. Uh, thanks so much to everyone who watched us live. Uh, if you have a Zoom session booked with William, uh, you should go go ahead and click that link uh, at your designated time spot. And uh, if you're interested in having a Zoom session, there are still some slots available. We'll keep those up for uh, another 15 minutes on the site, fullempirepromotions.com. Uh, sales... Uh, will end shortly, so head over to Full Empire Promotions and get them booked. And the autographs and the video greetings will remain available until tomorrow at noon. And uh, this wraps up our November events. I want to thank everyone who helped out and uh, made them a success and, and uh, joined in with them. Uh, I hope you join us for some great events we have planned next month that will include uh, Amy Yazbek, John Jarrett, uh, Kent McCord, and uh, a few other surprises coming up. So uh, thanks so much, guys. And uh, have a great day.